Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of Red Raptor Writes, where today we're continuing our review of everyone's favorite paleo documentary, Monsters Resurrected. You're joking, right? He's not joking. Last time we covered the first three episodes about Titanus, Tylosaurus, and of course, Spinosaurus. I would have loved to discuss that car car more, or maybe the Ginsu shark, but they barely made a cameo, so here we are. Nah, instead, we're talking about the last three episodes of Monsters Resurrected, which focus on the bear dog Amphicyon, Acrocanthosaurus, and Megalania, each awesome predators that have yet to appear on this channel. Once again, while many viewers want to see me annihilate this docu-series, I am doing my best to be fair. Part 1 had its ups and downs, especially with the Spinosaurus, but can Part 2 do any better? Will the show redeem itself in the end? Let's dig this up. Last time, I found myself surprised by the vast amount of compliments there were to give. We saw many problems too, but yeah, don't count out Monsters Resurrected just yet. Episode 4 features the humpbacked Acrocanthosaurus. For the thousandth time, a creature is compared to the other giant North American predator, Tyrannosaurus Rex. <laughs> T-Rex is pretty much the successful cousin who everyone brags about 24-7. As annoying as the constant comparisons get, there is a great point that the Acro, along with its Carcharodontosaurid relatives, had thin, blade-like teeth better used for slicing the flesh of its prey items. These teeth could have been helpful in cutting large pieces of flesh off the mighty sauropods, then bleeding its prey to death. This is opposed to T-Vex, who had thick, Railroad spikes, better for crushing bone. Smashing helped them mostly feast on smaller but well-armored animals such as Triceratops, Taurosaurus, and Ankylosaurus. Now, call me a conspiracy theorist, but it seems to me that there are two competing acro designs here. The most common scene is the greener variant with a heavier body and a shorter, thicker skull. I don't know why this is the one we see more of, considering how inferior it is to the second variant, with the more grey color palette, longer and lower skull, and sleeker body. This one seems more in line with the current understanding of this dinosaur, rather than being a T-Rex wannabe. I, just, I can't fucking COMPETE! I just can't fucking COMPETE! CAN YOU GET THE F*** OUT OF MY FACE?! Who knows, maybe I'm just going insane, well, more insane really. In other news, the bear dog from episode 5 gets a lot of love. While the Amphicyon's design and animations look strange and monstrous, which is a norm for this series, the overall animal is awesome, being a cross between, well, a bear and a dog. And this isn't a psych out like Hyenadon, which wasn't a hyena, or the hell pigs, which weren't actually pigs. The Discovery Channel understands that these were neither bears nor dogs, instead being early branching caniforms. Because of their placement in the carnivoran family tree, Amphicyonids shared features with bears and dogs. We see the long floofy tails like the puppy babies of today, but with the larger size and plantigrade feet of bears. Doggies are digitigrade walking on their toes as opposed to plantigrade bears that walk on the soles of their feet. Again, the Amphicyonids are placed correctly on the family tree. The order Carnivora is a large and diverse group of placental mammals that include modern terrestrial predators such as canines, bears, and cats. Carnivora is split into two major flavors or suborders if you want to be scientific. One is Filiformia, which includes all cats, hyenas, mongooses, and all their relatives. The second is Caniformia, the group that includes puppies, bears, mustelids, pinnipeds, and previously the Amphicyonids. And there wasn't just one Gigachad Amphicyon. The documentary correctly points out how this family of bear dogs was very diverse nearly as verse as the collection of Bad Friends episodes. Some were big and bulky like the family namesake, but others were tiny and lean critters that scurried around in the underbrush. 
It sucks that the animators either didn't have the budget, the time, or the creativity to correctly animate these smaller cousins because they're depicted as just scaled down amphicyons. Unfortunately, everyone in this family died out, as if they made Winnie the Pooh memes in China. The extinction is generally well done, with the bear dogs dying out due to climate change and competition from more derived predators like early canids. You guys all think you're so much better than me! The final episode, Giant Ripper, resurrects the largest terrestrial lizard of all time, Megalania. In Monsters Resurrected, it's shown off as pretty much just a giant monitor lizard, which, yeah, fair enough. These were monitor lizards, very closely related to the scaly boys we see today, but around 20 feet long. Size estimates have varied over the years due to the incompleteness of their remains and various methods used for scaling up their remains from their relatives. The comparisons made between the young and the old are very reasonable. For example, in Jurassic Fight Club, gosh we have to mention that again, the writers went with the Komodo dragon myth that they carry extra deadly bacteria in their mouths to help kill prey. Resurrected gets the one-up on those chumps by debunking this idea and realizing that monitor lizards have glands in their mouths to mix venom in with their spit. So when these guys bite down on their target, the venom oozes into the wound. The venom then acts as an anticoagulant to prevent clotting and lowers blood pressure, causing the victim to bleed to death. Well, it still beats experiencing Topher Grace's Venom, and Tom Hardy's if we're being honest. Some of the side entries get a fair amount of love too. The marsupial lion is featured alongside its lizardly contemporary and is spot on, or should I say, striped on, considering how these guys were striped. Thank goodness I'm not a dad yet, or the jokes will get even worse. Experts believe this since cave paintings featuring Tylacolio show stripes running down their body. Unfortunately, those early humans weren't the best artists. We got no marsupial lion NFTs, but hey, stripes. The rest of the portrayal checks out too with a short, wide face filled with these very strange buck teeth that may look goofy but would have been deadly. These predators also possessed a large thumb claw on each hand, which was useful for either climbing, slashing, or both. A somewhat or arboreal lifestyle is explored by Discovery, which is on point. The other carnivore, Episcion, is also done justice. While these were early canids, much like the pups we have today, their differences are exhibited too. For one thing, Episcion is correctly shown with a larger head but a shorter snoot. Couple these with teeth similar to a hyena, and we see a picture of a bone-crushing animal, allowing them to get more nutrients out of a carcass than their competition. Both the Protodon and Procoptodon are appropriately strange. If you think Australia is a bad place today, where everything wants to kill you, just wait until you see how it was 50,000 years ago. Weird cat wannabes striking from trees, giant lizards, and 8 foot tall kangaroos, it was a mess. The Procoptodon isn't simply the big roo, but had a flat face unlike any other, with forward facing eyes. This was the trend for its subfamily called Stenurinae. And finally, those the Protodons are stated to have been the largest marsupials ever, which they were. You'd have to be on some serious drugs to screw them up, so thankfully that isn't the case. Their snoots are as big as their hearts. Like the other megafauna featured, humans did come into contact with the protodon. Their interactions, along with climate change, may have been the cause for their extinction. Last time, we saw a super outdated Spinosaurus, and it's great that our knowledge of those mysterious giants has grown tremendously over the past decade. For part 2, there aren't as many outdated elements, but still a few updates worth mentioning. Megalania has become a name that strikes fear and wonder into the hearts of paleo nerds. However, that name is no longer valid since it was more closely related to some monitor lizards than other species within the Varanus genus. So as common sense would have it, Megalania priscus is now Varanus priscus. 
Nowadays, and for the purposes of this video, Megalania is used as an unscientific nickname. In the Great American Predator episode, Acrocanthosaurus hunts and slaughters a sauropod called Paluxysaurus, named after the Paluxy River in Texas where its remains and trackways have been found. Unfortunately for the filmmakers, more finds of sauropod remains caused the genus to be synonymized with Sor Poseidon in 2012. So, like Megalania, the name Paluxysaurus is invalid. Lastly, the final episode shows Procoptodon hopping around like the kangaroos we love today, but looking at the hip and leg anatomy of them and their close relatives, scientists find it unlikely that they could have hopped. Instead, they would have walked upright on two legs to get around. And interestingly enough, if you throw a modern kangaroo into a pool, it'll paddle its legs back and forth like a walking motion we're more used to. So they do have the ability to walk. That feature is just tucked away inside their brains. Despite all the compliments, there is still a metric buttload that goes wrong in these final episodes. If you wanted a rant, then here you go. And here we go. Deinonychus appears as a contemporary of Acrocanthosaurus, which is true. It's hard to tell whether they're supposed to be scaly or have a light fuzz, but both are wrong. Deinonychus and its dromaeosaurid relatives had well-developed contour and wing feathers. Skipping out on raptor plumage would be just as awful as showing scaly chickens or hairless bears. There's no excuse at this point. Many documentaries we've looked at so far have included feathers, even several years before this. Its rival, the much larger Acro, and heck, even Spino, stand too upright at times, even going into a near completely vertical stance like I'm watching the original King Kong. Hey Discovery Channel, the 1930s called, they want their dinosaurs back. The relationship shown between the two is that the smaller Deinonychus were able to outcompete younger Acros while raiding Acro nests, so the smart, pack-hunting raptors replaced Acrocanthosaurus as the apex predator in early Cretaceous North America. First of all, the two theropods would have fulfilled different niches, with Deinonychus eating smaller animals in the antlers and cloverleaf formations, such as Aquilops and Zephyrosaurus, while the larger predator feasted on the likes of Astrodon, Saur Poseidon, Tenontosaurus, and Sauropelta if it was brave enough. Secondly, Deinonychus most likely did not hunt in packs. Congregations of them around Tenontosaurus remains were more likely to be the result of more mobbing behavior of unaffiliated individuals or scavenging turned feeding frenzy. So if a bunch of them were attracted to the same Tenontosaurus, they might have attacked but not in an organized team like wolves. Actually, pack hunting in general is something this series screws up. We see Deinonychus, Acro, and Rugops pack hunt without evidence to back this up. And third, there's no indication that raptors caused the Acro's downfall. The two coexisted from the Aptian to Albion stages of the Cretaceous. It's not like this Carcharodontosaur disappeared once Deinonychus showed up. Look at me, sure. Look at me, sure. I'm the captain now. Monsters Resurrected gets much right when it comes to the Amphicyon, too bad they fell into some mishaps. Amphicyon is described as this large, vicious predator that immigrated from Asia into North America to terrorize the new landscape. This didn't happen. Actually, the opposite is true. Bear dogs originated in North America during the Eocene and spread until their downfall in the late Miocene. And those early Amphicyonids weren't nearly as large as the family's namesake. Again, this was a very diverse family. These guys started small, under the heel of the ruling Hyenodonts. It was only when the Hyenodonts died out that the bear dogs grew to take their place. In the same episode, audiences are introduced to Dino Hyas, which totally boggles my mind. For a decade at this point, Dino Hyas had been synonymized with the North American Entelodont Deodon Shoshonensis. While I'm on the subject, many comparisons have been made between the Entelodonts and pigs, with the family even earning the nickname 
Hell pigs. Despite morphological similarities, the Deodon and friends weren't pigs. Instead, they belonged to a clade with hippos and cetaceans that I won't even attempt to pronounce. I'm sure I butcher half the names anyways, but let me cut my losses here. It's been joked about a thousand times before. Ever since its discovery, people have been saying, Haha, isn't it funny that T-Rex has such small arms and they were probably good for nothing. Ha! Never heard that one before. Well, this show falls into that same trap when comparing the Acro and the Tyrannosaurus. When, in actuality, T-Rex had very strong arms that still clearly had a lot of function, they were able to individually curl over 400 pounds. So, very clearly, they were lifting something. We have to dispel the myth that T-Rex had vestigial arms that were useless. Alright, let's close this out with a silly comment made by the narrator. Acrocanthosaurus is called the first meat eater in North America evolved to take down large prey. What? What the f- <laughs> Hey, screw Allosaurus, Torvosaurus, and Saurophaganax. They're total losers, right? North America had large sauropods before the acro arrived and plenty of large predators to take advantage of the food source. To erase millions of years of prehistory like that is crazy. Monsters Resurrected is a wild ride of a documentary series. We've gone through many ups and many downs. Some topics, like Monitor Lizard Venom, get nailed, while others, like the Spino, get railed. I don't know why there's such a gap in quality. Maybe an actually talented and brilliant writer died in the middle of the script and their less talented sibling came in to finish it. Too bad that sibling got a hold of the Spino and Acro episodes because the rest were decent. I'm actually surprised at how much this paleo documentary still works. I expected nothing but a nightmare scenario. So even if you guys want me to slap an F on this, I need to be fair and give Discovery Channel's Monsters Resurrected the very first D. Not great by any stretch of the imagination, but honestly, with all things considered, not the worst either. It just occurred to me that Jack Horner's Scavenger Rex idea was so bad that it couldn't even beat the 273 foot Spino. Remember, if you enjoyed this video, to please leave a like, subscribe, and check out my social media. See you next time.